Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team podcast, connecting Kill Team communities across the globe. If you're passionate about the tactical skirmish game that brings together strategy, lore, and creativity, you are in the right place. Don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe, and stay updated with our latest episodes. If you want to support the show, check out our Patreon. Your support means a lot to us. Follow us by using the social media links in the podcast description for all the latest news, and be sure to leave a review to let us know what you think. Thanks for tuning in. Here's today's episode. We're back with our most common uh, guest co-host, Shane from Command Point. Wow, I'm still the most common, huh? Crazy. I, I guess I don't think about it, but this is like the fifth time <laughs> or something. <laughs> that sounds about right, yeah. Luckily for us, there's plenty to talk about with the new edition right on the horizon, the it seems like on the the day before uh, this weekend a lot of the stuff will have come out a little bit so we could talk about yeah what what we're excited for on the new edition a lot of stuff yes. i mean i'm i'm stoked we've basically got we've got a whole new game on built on top of the old bones of kill team a game that we all thought was a huge upgrade over the oldest edition of kill team that was modern and now we have basically a new way to play forced interaction because the current Kill Team 21 approved ops decks kind of let people camp out a little bit across the six objectives. Yeah, it's a it's a huge change. I mean, the game is going to be very different, but it's the same game we love, but like like more like streamlined, it feels like. So I'm very excited. And I guess before uh, just... To, I just want to do my shout out now because I'll forget to do it at the end. Yeah, um, if you guys are listening to this before all the command point stuff, because we released a bunch of stuff today also, um, after you're listening to this and all the Just Another Kill Team podcast stuff, uh, go check out all the stuff that Ryan and I released because there's so much of it. <laughs> it was a lot to record. Um, and I'm sure so many people are going to be like fiending for just as many takes about the new edition as possible so there's no shortage of it but yeah for anyone looking for gameplay there should have been a play on tabletop episode that came out a couple days mm-hmm. on the 21st so take a watch i'm on there playing a game against tau nick again on his vespid as the mm-hmm. tempestus aquans lots of exciting cool. content love it yeah the the new rules are very streamlined but also there's like a million different win paths like a million different ways to to claim the big w um, with the whole the way that the gambit works and the tack ops like i mean there's there's 12 tack ops and that in itself if you put all of your eggs in that one basket that's a nine point opportunity yeah every single mission can be very dynamic with all these potential combinations i've had games where i'm like um like mid game i'm like oh man should i like pivot to primary because it looks like my opponent isn't doing well in primary and i can like like get a stranglehold on that and having to think about it that way. And it's not so binary where it's like, I just want to get as many points as possible. Um, because with primary in particular, there's like a, there's like a finite amount of primary points that could be scored in a lot of these missions. Like if you're scoring more, your opponent is scoring less. So you can, you'll have those moments where you think about, I wasn't going to focus on primary this game, but board state kind of looks like I should start focusing on primary a little bit um in addition to you know kill op which is more of a passive thing and tack op which is like you're going on your own little adventure which i love because i used to complain about how i thought not complain but i used to say don't take tack ops that feel like side quests um but i think in the design space now all the tack ops are side quests which i like now i'm forced to do that now everybody's kind of forced to do that there's not a lot of tack ops where you're just kind of doing them passively some are going to be easier than others, but... One of the other big things is the new board design, because there's only three objectives. There's a lot more dead space. So some of these tack ops where you are supposed to go off on a side quest, there's nothing else to do. So it creates new mm-hmm. conflict zones. Like, for example, recover items. You can create areas of the map that your opponent has no reason to go to because there's no primary op over there. But suddenly, now you're forcing some of their attention into the corner. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there's like a lot of teams that I've noticed have... Um bonuses for doing like maybe their uh attrition gets a little better like they get offensive rerolls if they're standing near objective markers and that can include stuff like recover items so like you create more areas of the board where your guys are getting rerolls and stuff like that and, and it's kind of interesting yeah you I have feel to like think about the game card 
Corsair Void Guard are yeah. like a big big one for this. You know, you can create a new mm-hmm. conflict zone where if you're standing next to your recover item, it is a mission marker. It's a little 20 millimeter thing that has a mm-hmm. one inch control level, which is also probably one of the biggest changes, I think, from the old edition to the new edition is now all tokens are 20 millimeter objects. And then there's 40 millimeter primary objectives. Yes. Yeah. Objectives are a lot bigger now, weirdly. I mean, kind of bigger, like they're... Uh, like the actual objective markers, I think are a little bigger, but the mission markers are smaller. Um, before you could like have anything be a mission marker as long as it wasn't like too big. Yeah, before uh, it was a point on the map and you centered on a thing, and now everything is standardized to a 40 or a 20, and then a one inch control range that you need to be visible to. And that actually also presents some new changes to how a lot of people have been playing games. So in the older edition of Kill Team, you know, you would control things in a two inch bubble and you could see it on one side of the wall, not really interact with your opponent and kind of camp out. But now with Volcus and doors being door fightable on Volcus, which I assume many of the new games of Kill, Kill Team are going to be played on. You can get attacked by a door. Yeah, hatch fights on open. It's a pretty big deal. Um, and for all the yeah. Kill Team veterans out there, the OG markers are actually the same size. Those were 40 millimeter tokens as well. So if you have like the old <laughs> set of tokens, um, those objective markers work. Yeah, we'll have the new, newly sized ones for the New York Open 3. So they will be paired with our New York City streets and we'll have manhole covers that are 3.57 inches wide so that you can camp out on the streets of Manhattan and duel it out with your opponents. I love it. Huge fan. Cannot wait. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, I think the, I mean, what do you guys want to talk about? Are we going to talk about the teams, the core rules, approved ops? Because I have a lot of thoughts on all of it. So, I mean, whatever direction you want to go in. I mean, let's say we start from the top, uh, approve the, the approved ops cards. There's definitely a lot to talk about there. Well, the most important one, I think, for all of us more competitively minded players is we're moving over to a world where we have layouts. How do we feel about okay. this? Like terrain layouts? Yeah. Um, pretty wild. I haven't had the chance to play on a lot of them yet. Um, I, I've played on some of the Into the Dark ones, and I I personally actually like them. I've, I've, I know some people aren't a big, huge fan of them, and they say there's a lot of empty space. But I think what you were talking about earlier, Travis, the game and like the tech ops sort of create more on the board than it actually looks like for these Into the Dark uh, setups. But I, I think the way that ITD plays is so interesting now where you... Like, I think when people are playing ITD, they're just going to, like, reserve one of their four equipment slots for barricades, like, every single time. Yeah. And I actually think that for, like, some of the wider shooty teams, they probably, like, maybe don't want to actually do that. It's maybe better to not do that, because in a, what you end up doing is, like, giving your opponent with lost activations more stuff to hide behind. Um, And I think it's going to be, like, it's going to take some, like, growing pains for people to, like, get used to, like not doing like what their gut tells them to do. Like this is a lot of open space and there's nowhere to take cover on objectives. So therefore I need to take barricades. I'm not used to not having barricades, but I mean, what is a team like Pathfinder's dream? It's a board with no barricades or terrain. <laughs> like like <laughs> the, I, the shooty horde players are going to have to get used to that and like realize that they do actually like that. And it's better for them if a game is like that, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah I mean, in the current, current edition pathfinders love in the dark compared to open Mm -hmm. so yeah yeah and i think any team with seek light too is gonna love into the dark for sure yeah um real quick wave top overview there are four different cards for different layouts um diagonal deployments are totally gone the the main three are beta decima into the dark and Volcus, and then there's a uh, separate layout for just like you do whatever you want with terrain. Here's where the objective markers go. Um, so that leaves us with six fixed layouts available to each of the the zones there. And the into the dark ones have some very very open rooms. Like one of them is like forty percent of the board is one giant open room. Basically, I mean, I'm maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit, but there is yeah. a there is a lot a lot of space. Um, which is definitely, like Shane was saying, a great opportunity to like to leave it as open space if you want to shoot or like putting one or two barricades can actually make an enormous difference in like having places to leap and bound to get across those big rooms. And it's just like it really, really validates the equipment choices a lot, I think. Yeah, and I think some teams, uh, some factions more than others are going to lean more heavily on their 
faction equipment. And I think those teams might have a little bit of trouble on Into the Dark because they feel obligated to take barricades. And sometimes you are just going to have to take barricades depending on your opponent. Um, I mean, you do still have the option in scouting to pull out some going. extra barricades. Yeah, that's where I was going. So it's I think a lot of teams are going to feel pigeonholed into taking that on Into the Dark sometimes. Um, that's what I've been doing in a lot of my Into the Dark games is just grabbing the equipment choice. Whereas on Open, I feel like I'm not doing that quite as much. So, yeah. Yeah, there's definitely some terrain layouts that you're going to feel like you need to go do some of the stuff. Maybe it turns out that you're a little bit safer than you think you are, so you really don't need them early on, and you just play this weird staging game where you leave a guy in the background who you're like, I'm pretty sure he's going to die to a headshot at some point, but he's done his job. You look, score a button, or you go up to the mid board and run away. <clears throat> yeah, so yeah. I mean, I, I wanted to ask you guys, because you've been looking at the rules like in, separate from me, and I don't know all your thoughts, so... I think a lot of people are going to have opinions like archetype wise, looking at these approved ops, what kind of teams are going to be good? Is it going to be elites? Is it going to be mid range? Is it going to be shooty horde? Like, do you think it gives a good balance for everybody? Like, what do you guys think? I, like, what's going to make a strong team? I extremely think that elites are just enormously, enormously better. Um, just like mm -hmm. counteract is such a big deal. Um, the, the previews that we saw with the, all the all the elites pretty much are going up to 14 wounds which is just mm -hmm. like also a big deal because um legionaries with 14 wounds is just like they're gonna squeak by and do a lot more and just like le the time of the elites is is here i and jason will be true. will be trying that the entire time because i won't be playing elites <laughs> I will also be joining you playing elites, Jason, because I was an elite player last edition and the edition before that. So um, although I did swear off elites in the second or like this past year of second edition, um, trust me, it took everything in my power not to play Nemesis Claw, uh, but I, I resisted the temptation. But now I feel like it really is a thing again. So I'm I'm very excited. And it's not just elites. It's just I think teams in general have more opportunities versus teams that out activate them um which obviously yeah, elites sure. are going to run into that more often but like i was playing um uh, and i guess this is not really related to the out activation part but um i wanted to touch a little on like initiative and like losing initiative feels nice to me now like i don't mind it nearly as much um like i played a game of vespids versus echelons where both 10 model teams and i kept losing initiative every turn but the extra cp i was getting was huge and I kept getting last activation because we were trading even and like having last activation is actually really awesome. Um, so I don't know. I, I think there's just like little things that are just yeah. like flipped on its head a little. That's a great point because last activation is honestly like can be just as impactful as first activation. So like mm -hmm. don't forget about that. Plus you get that extra CP and it's it's exactly like that. It's like, oh, I lost yeah. initiative and you're like, ooh, extra CP, you know, like I am not mad about that at all. And some teams can you know, like use that CP to like get a like a dash or something in the strategy phase to like pull themselves back um, to like maybe make themselves safe against that first activation play, and then you still have a CP left over to work with, and you get last activation. So it's like it's pretty sweet. Yeah, there's options in the strategy phase on teams like commandos to get the extra movement. So as long as you're saving it for your opponents, then now you suddenly, oh, I lost initiative. Now everyone is scattered to the four wins. And I assume that Kasserkin will probably end up keeping whatever their current rule is because that's very core to the Kasserkin identity. So even though we don't know what's going to happen with them, I would be very surprised if something like that didn't make it through the transition to the new edition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and Travis, I'm curious, what are you looking at most excited about faction wise for the new edition? I think, annoyingly enough, looking at kind of how some of these new teams are structured and how elites look, there's a and how they've shown off the new plasma gun. They've tried to narrow down some of the lethality. And then I look over at the new rules for commandos who still get to have six attacks. And so every once in a while, theoretically, the bomb squig could actually survive blowing up a dynamite now. And I, I weep and sob for our, for our friends who now, who now have to play commandos for a whole new edition for another probably at least one year, if not three at our non-classified local game tournaments. Yeah, commandos are weird because they have like, I was looking at them and they have like no, um, 
like piercing almost. I think on the whole team. Is there any piercing on that team? No, there's just more dock Yeah, now they just, they just make up for it with more, more dice. Because it basically yeah, has the same effect. Yeah, I mean that is true. They they just shoot a lot. They've got pretty good uh melee. They're still the huge. Board. They've still got beefy. their and now they have their once a game dynamite, and then they have their harpoons that are once a turn, and they're everybody has them all the time. So even though I'm like excited for this new edition, stuff like commandos coming through, obviously the commandos are one of the most popular teams. So I'm not surprised that they made it into this edition with a pretty solid set of rules. It's still going to be interesting to watch new players run into the wall of the green tide just as they did yeah. before <laughs> yeah they're i think they're going to be more like i don't know they they look they're, less toxic to me than they did they're before. very shooty now compared to before yeah yeah i can see that too they're i'm i'm excited to see what people do with well, like, uh with commandos you could totally bring a bunch of boys and just pop a whole wall of smoke creep up on everybody and then just go to chop city yeah, yeah, you could do that, Commando Boy. I um, it's it's interesting. I mean, also you've got stuff like the new list building potential because hey, flamers are a little better now, so the Burna might be a guy. Yeah, flamers in like general. That's actually a good note to just hit on right now. It looks like for the most part we've gone to three three damage with no cover. It's kind of cute hitting on yeah. twos, which is huge because hardly anything hits on twos anymore. Yeah, and I mean, I I know the for the most part it's just no cover with with torrent. But like I guess on the topic of the Burna, he's got that deluge ability where he can cut the range of his flamer in half to four inches and he gets seek light. So that's yep. pretty cool. Um, yeah, we're, we're back in a world where ranges matter. So we've got four, yeah. eight, six. Uh, it turns out that on commandos, you can add collapsible stocks and jump another four inches, I think. Mm, yeah, yeah, I believe so. So we're we're going to have to have different sized rulers or we're going to move to the Age of Sigmar world where you have a, a brick of all the rulers at exactly the right sizes for the game now. Yeah, <laughs> man. So how are we feeling? So I assume we're all we're all pretty excited to have normal measurements back and we're not using the world of strange shapes and polygons. Yeah, I feel like the the next kill team ruler that's going to be cool, uh, probably still one of those one, two, three inch and then like a like one three nine or whatever there's like some of those multi-angled rulers that have a nine on there that's probably going to be helpful for kill team now yeah and like as a jaeger fan the fact that there exists numbers between three and six makes me really happy now it's fantastic so you can actually move up the board a little bit and have seven inch charges and stuff so yeah dwarves broadly went up to five inches of movement mm -hmm. which is and, nice. I mean, we, and oh go ahead we see corsairs at seven so it does look mm -hmm. like Broadly, there are three classes of movement. The fast models at seven, the slow models at five, and the normal people at six, which is nice. Yeah. And you pair that with climbing and dropping being a little easier most of the time. Uh, and mobility in general is, is a little bit... There's not going to be like the four-inch moving guys that can't climb anymore. Like You have, you have that ability to just uh, kind of get up on vantages a little bit easier. Even the dwarves of the world can move two inches on the most vantages, assuming they're not, you know, leaping over the, the ramparts. Yeah. Um, for anyone that hasn't seen how climbing works yet, um, it's just in increments of one inch. Uh, and then you round up going up and round down going down. Yeah. So like on Octarius, for instance, if you're going, uh, if you're climbing and you're not climbing the rampart, like you're climbing from the like the ledge or like the part of the the wall that doesn't have the rampart it's only three inches so the three the six inch movers still get three inches going up the dwarves and the necrons can still go two inches up and the elves i mean they're just gonna be flying around it's they don't even care they might as well have fly <laughs> yeah ooh, those corsair rules you know you still get your free dash yeah. you get your seven inches of move and there's so many ways to get out of out of phase movement now mm -hmm. yeah and if you give up your dash in your out of phase movement, eh, it's really not that bad because you still have moved 10 inches, which compared to everyone else will sometimes feel like two inches. Sometimes will feel like three or four inches. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, it's it's very interesting. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about obscuring with you guys to so you get your thoughts on obscuring, because I have some thoughts. I, I mean, what do you guys think about it? Yeah, as far as like the big broad changes for this edition, you know, climbing, dropping, losing traverse, those are all kind of movement related things. But now we've got a somewhat new ish cover system that uses 
a lot of the broad concepts we had before, but cleans up some of the language. Because now Vantage has a different function or against concealed or engaged operatives, you know, getting either accurate one or two, depending on how high, high up you are. And then also giving your opponent cover saves when they are getting shot at while concealed. But the big boogeyman of this current edition when learning the game is obscurity. We've got a one inch bubble, a two inch bubble, things got to be different ranges away. You've got your own personal one inch bubble. And you know what? We chucked all that out the window because it's too annoying to use. And now we've got the joint one inch bubbles on both sides. So (laughs) much easier to explain to a new player. A lot easier. The only thing that scares me is like if you're in cover from heavy and you know how people do the inside outside thing with like barricades so that they're in cover, but they can't be charged. Yeah. If you're inside outside, I'm on heavy. Does that mean you have cover and you're obscured? I believe that <laughs> by the letter of the law in the book, you can get there is a way to do it. And I, I think it was mentioned like that should Nova. get FAQ'd or something. So <laughs> I, I suspect think... I suspect it is physically possible for you to get both heavy and cover right now, but. I suspect that's not what they want. We'll see what happens. I don't think so. So (laughs) actually, and like, even if that is the case, if you can like change the angle you're shooting them from, because that's going to be such a precise placement. If you're able to move over and hit them from like five degrees, a different angle, they'll be out out of that. Yeah, that's a good point. It it is a very precise angle. So it's probably easy to play around, Um, at least to make it so that they're only getting one and not both. Because honestly, most of the time, if you're obscured, obscurity is so good to have as the defender that you don't probably don't even need cover most of the time yeah um yeah but i mean like with if you're really like trying to like thread the needle like that and you're just like barely one inch to halfway through the the thing so that you you have both if if they play around that i think they would deny both it'd be pretty easy to just be like you don't you're not obscured and you don't have cover if you just like move like de- depending on the board layout if you, you know, like move the angle of shooting by like five or ten degrees all of a sudden they're completely out in the open yeah that's it's probably possible cases. i mean that was the one of the only things that sounded weird to me the other thing that i would like to see a little clarification on is some of the universal equipment um, I think there is maybe some toxic stuff with razor wire and barricades, like combined. That razor wire should... definitely seems like a rough one because the moment you are within an inch of it, your next movement costs an ex- an additional two inches, which is kind of the traverse pack tax right now. But you haven't done anything. Yeah, so like just traversing it, most models won't even be able to, unless they're like pressed right up against it and they have at least six inches movement. That's for like um, putting them both together. You're talking about. Well, just the razor wire alone, because you still have to, like, quote, traverse it. Traverse isn't a thing, but you, like, climb drop. So that costs you two inches. And because it's razor wire, it has the rule where if you go within an inch of it, you subtract two inches from your movement, basically. So if you're trying to traverse effectively a razor wire, it costs four inches. And you can't climb with a dash, which is what traversing is. Traversing is just climbing now. So you would have to be able to do it just with two inches of movement. Because one inch isn't enough for anything because the back of your base doesn't break the barrier. So you need to have like six inches or more and you need to be like pretty much pressed up against it to start. So kind of terrifying. Oh, yeah. So you basically could like dash up to it and like touch it and then barely get over it. And that's going to be really, really annihilating your movement. But I mean, I guess that's the point of razor wire. Yeah, you don't yeah. throw a, bo- a box of barbed wire into a corner and expect people to just walk through it. So I think it's kind of okay. And really, the most important thing about even if that is toxic, is it really only defends one flank? Yeah, and for only sure. against like melee operatives because you're only allowed the one razor wire. So one of the cool things about the universal equipment is you take one selection and you can't take like three ammo caches. Yes, yes. Because that would be hilarious if you could like stack three comms devices and your one supportability suddenly catapults you nine inches. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Or if they daisy chain yeah. and then your one command structure just reaches the whole battlefield. It's like, but you give now, up all your other equipment for it. Now imagine razor wear, but somebody plopped a barricade right behind it and they put them both right in front of a access point on Insta Dark. That's the only stuff I can think of that I think I would like to see some clarification on. Um, because before we weren't allowed to put barricades within two inches of a- access points. And I think, I don't know if they just forgot that rule or if that's intentionally been left out. There's a couple um, of changeovers on the yeah. rule sets for the kill team, uh, for the old kill zone. So like on Gallo Dark for in the dark stuff, they mm-hmm. removed the visibility requirement around walls, which used to be there. Yeah. And they also got rid of the thing where if your line crosses through an engaged operative, you lose a dice. I couldn't find that anywhere in the rules. So I, I'm pretty sure that's gone as well. Um, 
Um, yeah, you'd, so. you'd kind of sort of touched on the one of the big changes with the doors as well, which uh, it costs an inch of movement to go through an open door. Yes. Accessible is the keyword. And that also applies to the open the doors on the open board. So the Volcus doors will cost an inch to go through and the into the dark doors when they're open cost an inch to go through. Um, and you can hatch wayfind on both as we chatted about. So if someone's trying to like block you in, like people used to do all the time on Octarius, just go like stand in front of the door. You'll just be like, uh, no thanks. And then you run up and just punch them through the wall. Yeah. Do a little hatchway fight. Yeah. And then like these little penalties to like go through doors and stuff. Um, some teams are just not going to care. Like Corsairs, they're not going to care at all. Um, I mean, the elf teams. Yeah, the dwarf teams, though, they're going to feel like they're living in last edition when they have to go through a door. So <laughs> it's it's going to be funny to see. Yeah. Um, OK, so here's a question for y'all. Beta Decima, do the new missions and the new universal equipment give it new life or not really? Uh, you know, it's I'm hard to say. Certainly going to make people try a couple sets at the New York Open. We've got new mission at mission boards. We've got some new stuff to try. And we everyone is stuck on three objectives now. So it's kind of we've kind of evened out on what the scoring potentials are going to look like. We'll probably select some of the nicer missions and give them a try and see how people feel about them. Yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely like I haven't deep dived on a new beta decima, um, but I have looked at the rules and I do think it looks better than before. Um. I think it's going to be like a little more easy to have like playable games on it. Whereas before it was a pretty like skewy in terms of what was good and what was bad. Yeah. yeah I think like, just the, the fact that ladders can help you out and place stuff where mm-hmm. it makes sense. And now suddenly it only costs you an inch to get up. Whereas before you had to look for climbing rope or you were just like kind of SOL. So that helps a ton. Yeah. The biggest thing, in my opinion, well, not the, one of the biggest things for Beta Decima is be, the core rule that lets you move through your friendly operators' bases means you can't get, like, log jammed as much on those skinny gantries. Um, so I, I think that's going to go a really long way, along with, like you said, the ladders, I think, are going to be a really big deal. Yeah, in general, I think the all the equipment is going to, like open a whole door for people to get innovative and do things that catch a lot of people off guard and like maybe like a melee horde with a couple well-placed like barricades and a heavy barricade all of a sudden can like get where they need to go and like start slaying people so Mm -hmm. hold on to your hats because i think there might be a little bit of that yeah no definitely so i guess we have some teams that we want to talk about today did you guys have any teams you wanted to touch on in particular i think we We talked talked on commandos a little bit corsairs a little bit Yeah, we did tap on the dwarves, but I don't have any one that I really need to deep dive because I'm not obviously none of these teams have ever been teams that I was very, very into. So yeah. I'm I'm still waiting a little bit for my time to shine. But obviously, we've got two elite masters here and we do have the nemesis claw to talk about. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to talk about elites just based on these nemesis claw rules, plus what we know about the core rules and approved ops. Jason, I know you got to be really excited for these guys. I am. Uh, nemesis claws is also like my their whole thing is sneaking and that is not my whole thing at all like uh, last the last like whole year of kill team i played i did not use conceal orders at all <laughs> it was very admirable but now you're forced to start with conceal orders jason how all i gotta do is start with them and then you can change them yeah you yep. can change them. <clears throat> so um, i mean i the extra wounds first of all for um for our night lords here that's pretty that's great huge. That's huge. Yeah, that is huge. You guys could talk about uh, the new Astartes rule. Probably the biggest core change to what I assume will be all of the big Astartes teams is the full inclusion of double shoot and double fight. Yeah. It's just like a baked um, in faction ability. And the yeah, ability I mean, to counteract on any order. So if you want to sneak up and creep up against these horde teams, you are fully empowered to get those extra two inch wiggles. So just really quick on the Astartes thing that blows my mind that I don't think people might catch right away is the the fact that before uh like shoot twice and fight twice was basically labeled as you if you're doing one of them they say you're shooting twice you aren't able to fight period or if you fight twice you aren't able to shoot period now you can shoot twice and if you shoot twice you can't fight twice but it doesn't say that you can't fight once and shoot twice or vice versa so that paired with counteract means that like you're going to be seeing some like easy triple kill activations well maybe not easy but from some operatives you're going to see like triple kills possibly happening if you start an engagement range 
plus, or I guess I should say control range. I got to get used to the new terminology, but um, starting in control range, punching somebody to death, and then pistoling one guy, and then pistoling another guy, and and then that's your activation, and then later you get to counteract too, and it's like, holy moly, that's crazy. Yeah, and then the counteract could be a charge. Yeah, it could be a two-inch charge. You could tap a point. You can close a door. You can do so much, um, and it's just a lot of it. I think a lot of like you could, being able to use your counteract resource to like stay alive for another turn sometimes can be like a huge difference. Um, because unlike mid range teams and horde teams, elites with this Astartes rule can counteract on conceal, which is a huge deal. Yeah. So, like, um, it used to be a safe strategy to shut down elites where if they get too close, you just charge them and don't fight. And now, mm-hmm. if you do that, even with a conceal order, they can fight you anyways. So, it's pretty much just a death sentence to try to do that now, um, which yeah. obviously I'm a huge fan of that. I love that. Yeah. That's a huge deal. Being able to, uh, to not get like, hugged by a guardsman um makes a really big difference uh being able to to like just the just the, like the flexibility now that you have just with that one little rule change i think goes a really long way um i do think i guess to like narrow down specifically on night lords um i actually like i'm looking at them and it's like in some ways they're obviously they have more wounds so they're tankier than before but they're kind of like are they tankier than before because this flayed skin is a lot worse but everybody gets it. And the Grizzly Trophy, I believe, is... Um, Once per battle now, rather than it being something else. Yeah, I think it's... Well, you don't start with it. You have to... You have to kill um, someone. Yeah, you have to kill somebody within in within two inches. And then you get the Grizzly Trophy token. And then... It's for the rest of the game, I believe. Um, people you mount the trophy like, yeah. on your back. <laughs> yeah, like you literally take the guy you just killed and you put his head on a spike on your is, on your backpack. There is some fun modeling opportunity there for the hobbyists amongst us. You know, get get a little magnet thing when your guy yeah. gets the first kill. You like uh, you like slap some flayed skin on yeah. some dude's chest. Oh man, yeah. Uh, honestly, magnets for the grizzly trophy. S tier idea. I love that. Yeah, pretty cool. Um, but yeah, so like there's weird ways where their their durability seems like it's bumped down a little bit, but maybe that doesn't matter because we have a few more wounds and, and you know, it's we've got all this other cool stuff. Um, scoring not happening on turn one is so huge for elites. I can't even stress that enough. Yeah, I think like conceptually from a, a broad gameplay perspective, elites have gotten this huge boost and that they're not forced to overcommit or play from behind for the entire game. You're like really starting off roughly at the same point as everyone else, maybe a quarter way up the board, ready to fight over some stuff. Or if you're t- being a little bold and you've lost initiative on that first turn, going into the second turn, you break ties. You send one guy up onto a point much earlier than he would be otherwise and just tell your opponent to deal with it. Yeah. No, and I mean, I just, I mean, Jason, how do you feel about something like Nemesis Claw getting smoke grenades? <laughs> like, you how know, great is that? I am very amused by the, uh, the idea of pretty much any of the elites with smoke grenades. Um, and they're uh, smoke grenades before, I like never use them because th- well, they wear out at the end of the turn and then you're just standing out in the open. Um, so that being fixed is huge because now the smoke grenades will last a little bit longer. It's like a D3 activations. Um, so that's like <laughs> something I'll actually look at and, uh, seems neat. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's really cool. Uh, less objectives is cool. I mean, I'm just, uh, I mean, I mentioned it about three object or no scoring on turn one. Like uh, the amount of games I had to play with elites where I'm going down two, four, just to like, feel like I have a chance going you forward. To. I think by the yeah. end of the game, if you were playing legionary or any of the elite teams, you have to come to a decision where you need to go down early so that you can get to turn four and still have three or four operatives because if you get to three or four operatives you had a good chance of really putting the hurt on your opponent when they're down to not enough operatives to fight your 12 wound three activation models yeah yeah and i think that's a really big deal so and and the other thing i want to talk about too is elites having that astartes role that shoot twice fight twice i think like it's going to take me and I think other elite players a little time to like wrap my head around that. Like if there's a guy within eight inches of one of my Marines, maybe it's better to just double shoot a bolt pistol into him, you know, and run away and, instead of, you know, charging and fighting and, and 
which might that's where exactly where my brain would go before. Like, especially if you have like a two wound guy who's like going to die to like a guardsman bayonet and you want to go in and kill that guardsman. But if they get more than one hit, you're dead. So now you could just go bolt pistol, bolt pistol. And then like, if they've already, if they're expended, you could just charge with your third APL. And then later, maybe they took a little damage and your counteract fight can finish them off. So like these little decision points where I'm like looking at it and I'm like, wait a minute, I can just shoot twice with a bolt pistol because you know, my, uh, my skin thief has a bolt pistol. So that's, that's like a real line that I can take now. Yeah. There definitely is going to be some, some big adjustments to, to get used to the new way that elites are going to play. Um, and yeah, I think there's, I've seen some mixed opinions, people chatting about like, is, is the, uh, ultra violence still going to be valid? Uh, I say, uh, extremely yes. I mean, I got to get plenty of way more games mm-hmm. into to really know. But I'm like, I think turn one violence is totally going to be like a worthwhile thing. So like, for example, uh, find someone that you can get a shot against, even if they're just like obscured, which is generally actually pretty easy to do to get like turn one obscured mm-hmm. shots against targets. And then like now I'm dangling, you know, a like a a warrior or whatever, and that gives you a reason to go engage. And if you ignore it, I'm just going to like overrun you. And if you go engage, then the, the shootout starts on turn one. Yeah. And that warrior is a little harder to kill than he used to be, especially because first of all, you have more wounds. Their plasma is worse. And, you know, like the best thing to kill an elite now for Imperium teams is a Melta, which is still only six inch range. Mm -hmm. So I think that Marines can like take a punch now, which feels good. Like Marines didn't feel like Marines last edition. They just felt like guys that hit really hard and their durability didn't mean anything because plasmas and Meltas were so good. Um, But yeah, it feels like more like you're playing a Marine now. So I like that. I think one of the things that Marine players are going to have to manage when playing against these larger teams is actually the kill grade. Because it turns out that the kill grade matters a lot for elites because every single operative basically gives your opponent a point. <laughs> Whereas for, for a horde team, you know, for something like the blooded, when you have 12 operatives, it's like, it starts off as like two, sometimes it's a three. So they're like chunks of operatives that where if you're not paying attention, you might feel like you're doing really well, but it could turn out that like, oh, I've lost four Marines. My opponent has actually a higher kill grade than me because I've only <laughs> killed six guys or seven guys. And you feel like, yeah, this is fine. So I think there's going to be some new lines of attack. So while we've been talking about elites, horde teams have to approach the game fundamentally from a very different approach now. Because in the current edition, you know, these wider teams can just mess around, wait for their opponents to gas out, and then just, you know, go do the buttons safely. Because we had six buttons, your opponent doesn't have a lot of operatives. But now between the kill grade and new infiltration... There are, there are new plans of attack for teams like Blooded. Yeah, they have to approach the game differently. And I think it's yeah. going to take people... Like I, I've said that a lot at this point <laughs> during this recording, is that people are going to take some time to get used to certain things. And I think players that run shooty hordes that have had their ways to win for the past three years, they have to think about it differently. And I think there's going to be some initial kickback of like, oh, like maybe elites are too strong... Well, well elites are going to be strong at the beginning. Oh, for sure. Especially like getting used to everything. And I think part of it is going to be like, maybe these shooty horde players need to just, maybe the thing they've been doing for the past three years doesn't work anymore and they need to do something different. Um, and That's and what I'm, I'm the excited. most excited for as a player, as a TO, as a community leader is watching people kind of adjust to the new plans and playing these things and having to readjust. Because you were talking about the tack op spreads earlier. Infiltration does look kind of hot. I haven't looked a lot at infiltration. Um, I have. Uh, I've really been enjoying security, actually. Actually, security, yeah, security for favorite. for the big elite team seems really good. You tell your opponent, "I'm going to. You need to come to my half of the board, or mm-hmm. you, I'm going to score two points." So. Yeah, yeah, it's sweet. Meet me in the middle, or de- or lose. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, and like amusingly, if you feel like you're being bullied by elite teams on the primary and the kill grade, just have uh, a gambit tack op. That is something that's really hard for them to counteract and uh, have yourself a game. One good one against elites, I guess, because people are going to complain about elites is, and I don't know why this tack op is in the recon tree, but the confirm kill, uh, so good against elites because you kill one guy and that token's there forever. 
and it's worth two points if you can just keep Marines from standing on it. And they're going to come and try and stand on it, and you're going to kill them for going into that spot. And it's like, I think that's going to be one of the better plays into elites uh, for teams that have access to recon. Yeah, for infiltration, you know, talking about blooded, a team that was trapped on seek and destroy for all of their existence, they finally have a new archetype, and that new archetype, by my eye, actually seems like one of the better scoring archetypes. They've got the ability to just tag someone, so you surveil or you surveil someone and you check if they're a valid target with a shooting attack and if you stay on conceal and stay alive you get two points mm -hmm. and against elites where you've got 12 operatives and you're scurrying about trying to do mission objectives and your opponent's like all right i'm gonna go kill this you know this dork on the midline objective so that he doesn't score a point you go boop there's a little surveillance dot from a sniper in the background and suddenly they've scored six points they've primary <laughs> off that and you've spent all this time donking some dudes but if you didn't dock them enough, like if you kill 10 of them, they're at like kill grade three, four. Yeah. So depending on the kill grade, you could just not have finished your kill grade at all against them. For sure. I mean, they only need to kill two thirds of you to like have a pretty good chance of. Yeah, if you don't hit their... so like, for example, on blooded, if you start with 12 operatives or 14 operatives, God forbid, you yeah. Your opponent has to kill 11 operatives before they hit kill grade four. So it's almost trivial for a blooded team to just sit in around, play infiltration, like scope out some Marines while they try to trade off a couple of Marines. And if they kill four of you, it's enough. Yeah. And I think a lot of the time deciding what your primary op is going to be, like when you're looking at kill op, you're thinking, can I get to kill grade four? I think yeah. if I can get to kill grade four, I can probably max get the max on the on the primary bonus. But if I can't do that, uh, I better hope I can max out my TAC Ops because primary op is going to be a little hard to max, I think, for most teams, um, especially if it's a competitive game, like a close game. So, yeah, I don't know. But like if yeah, everybody's think... thinking less about primary and you're like a melee horde and then you just kind of flood the board and grab all the objectives, that mm -hmm. might be just another backdoor to victory. Yeah, yeah so... for sure. That's what I'm the most excited for. Like, Blooded look like a team that fundamentally has changed a little bit at the edges. You know, the Blooded tokens are still there. They're still pretty powerful. They've gotten some new tools. You know, the Blooded Sniper gets to pick a dude and just get Gaze of the Gods against them. Yeah. <laughs> Which is yeah. pretty hot. But for because sure. they have access to Seek and Destroy and Infiltration, depending on what opposing team you see, what board or what mission it looks like you can go for storm objectives, you know, run the gullet of dudes down your opponent's back line, steal that primary point, or you look down an elite. I'm just going to go uh, surveil this dude three times over three turns. The, my sniper's all the way in the back because now obscurity doesn't stop valid targeting. You can literally have a sniper in the back line just like, oh, I see him. I'm going to stay here on a conceal order. Yep. Um, I want to talk about there's two there's two teams we have here that I think we're uh that we can talk about that I think we're like a little bit nerfed one more than the other. Yeah. Um, first of all, scouts, I think we're like, they're like back to normal. Like they got a little crazy for a second there at the end of last edition. And now they're, they're nine operatives again. Um, if I'm remembering and they are back like, to nine operatives, their knives aren't bonkers <laughs> crazy. There aren't power swords anymore. Yeah. And I think like, but, but some of the tricksiness has been upped a little bit with scouts. And I think they're going to be more of like a, a team true to what they were supposed to be on release rather than just like this wave of stat check shotgun knife dudes. guys. Yeah. Wall yeah. Dudes just like flexing out in front of their opponents. But <laughs> yeah. they did get to keep one critical thing, which is the Astartes bolt shotguns, which are still four tax on twos, four, four. Which, there you go. looking across the spread of teams, hitting anything better than a three is pretty rare. Most of the leaders don't even do it. Yeah. And yeah. having a bunch of guys that do it is crazy. And honestly, like, they are kind of like, the fact that they stayed as similar as they did, um, and a lot of other stuff kind of like, plenty of other stuff kind of toned down, I think kind of like puts them in like a surprisingly like pretty good spot. Like, yeah, like like Shane was saying, like how they, they kind of were meant to be at launch. Because like you can still, like one of their equipment options is the combat blades and knives. And then that brings your existing knives up to four or five damage, which is just amazing still. Um, mm -hmm. Plus with all your like blade ambush and stuff, you're just going to be chopping people up and going crazy. Um. And yeah, and those shotguns are great. And like, I, 
they're looking pretty solid. Yeah. Yeah, I think they're they're more they're going to be more interesting to me. They they seem like a more interesting opponent. I remember at Nova there was a couple scouts and I think in top 8 and I was going into top 8 thinking about that matchup like and it was just kind of a drag. It didn't sound very interesting. I, I was able to avoid the scouts, but like just games and like that. You were that playing Fogor, just... so you yeah. were playing the reverse wall of yeah. meatheads. You know, they've got the guns and you've got, oh, they've got the guns and the swords and you've got one and a half lives to throw yeah. at the wall of meat. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm excited for scouts to be more interesting. It makes me want to play them more. Um, they also have... It makes me want to play against them more, so... They've also got one of the new pieces of tech that a lot of teams don't get, which is a permanent silent gun. Yeah, that's you true. Know, we see we saw the Tempestus, I think, sniper maybe at the where we've seen the Tempestus uh, sniper at this point, And when he fires his gun, he comes out of concealment. Yep. Also, and, which I like that a lot. I like it a lot. Yeah, I like that a lot, design. too. Um, Especially just, now that vantage points provide cover words. So if you stand yeah. on top of a vantage and someone doesn't meet you at the floor, you are technically concealed. So you could just sit on a vantage point and just take shots. And the sniper on the scouts does actually ignore obscurity. So he's taking his full ballistic skill, hitting on twos, you know, dev three, just the classic kill team 21 sniper rifle and just nailing people from across the board. Yeah, really good. Um, one kind of stealth buff that they got was the guidance and experience on the sergeant, which is the handoff and APL doesn't have to be at the start of your activation anymore. It's just during your activation. So yeah. you could move hand it off, hand off an APL for free and still like double shoot because he's got the Astartes rule. Yep. And, and he also does have the actual Astartes rule. So he gets yeah. the counteract. He gets a double shoot, double fight. It's oh, baked yeah. into his data sheet, which is super sick because it does... It gives me hope that someday maybe we'll get the the Black Templar mixed squad. <laughs> yeah. Can you I imagine? already have the models for that. <laughs> three, three actual Astartes, five actual scouts just running around, yeah. Templaring it up. Um, I wanted to touch on Mandrakes a little uh, because they're mostly the same. I was hoping that the Night Fiend would be different, but he's pretty much the same. Um, one guy that is different, I think, in a meaningful way that is nerfed is the Dirge Maw. The Dirge Maw is hunting focus. Um, now, if he interrupts your action, you are forced to f attack that guy that he's interrupting. And if you aren't able to attack that guy he's interrupting in some way, shape, or form, you just can't do the interrupt. So before, you could focus a guy on the Maybe other side of the board objective. and then do a mission objective or say, you know what, I'm going to injure that guy before he activates. Now you can't do that. So like the, that's like one less toxic lane that I think people hated about playing against Mandrakes that, that is a little more reasonable now. Um, it's way more like lore accurate because the haunting focus is not just hauntingly focused on your whole team. It's on that one character. Yeah, he's he's there to to get distracted by somebody and cut them off. But it's not really possible if you're not on the same side of the board anymore. So I think Mandrake players have to use it a little more the way that ability was intended, probably in design, if I had to guess. Yeah, because it feels like the team kind of made it through the addition change, mostly unscathed. You know, a lot of these, it, it feels like, you know, looking at Nemesis Claw, some stuff did change, but like the core abilities all kind of loosely made it through about the same. Like Midnight mm -hmm. Clad gives obscurity in pretty much the exact same way that it, it does right now. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. It's it's mostly the same. Um, I don't I don't think Brood Brothers changed much. Um, they lost and destroy, are... right? Did they? I know they had like three uh, archetypes before. And yeah, I think they, they have two now, so they can no longer play Seek and Destroy, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yes, everyone I've looked at has had exactly two. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess I wasn't specifically looking for that trend, but I'm pretty sure that is the case. Yeah, I don't think I've seen a team with more or less than two. Like, what about Blooded? Blooded is a classic Blooded have two again. So I think I think one of the things that I was really annoyed with at the older edition of Kill Team was towards the you know season three releases we're just getting teams with all the archetypes and i was wondering with the changeover if we're going to switch over to just everybody had all the archetypes you just did whatever you wanted to so i'm glad that they actually re-narrowed it back down to everyone gets two and i suspect you know maybe someone like inquisition agents might not just because that was their identity of we are the hand of the inquisition nothing is untouchable for us so i suspect maybe that would be something that doesn't change up too much but Plus looking at Brood Brothers, they get infiltration and security. And yeah. Shane, we did talk about how security kind of hot right now. I like security. I like the contain one. I, I haven't tried them all, but I've had success using contain. 
Um, and also no more faction tag ops, which I am happy about because I think like the disparity in archetypes, like blooded having one and inquisition having four. And then on top of that faction tag ops can skew things even further. Now those are gone and every team seems like they have at least two archetypes. Um, and, and I think that's going to be a little bit less of a, like a one-sided thing. It'll also mean that players who are approaching a team for a new thing. So one of the big things is accessibility for this edition. You know, just having only four archetypes and nothing else means that if when you set down to a table, you're not going to have to reincorporate all this extra information if you've never seen the team before. Yeah. Now every team seems two archetypes and one of them gets played in the game. So really, like the the scale creep of learning the rules has been trimmed down a lot, but the complexity of actually the tactical decision-making has not really shifted all that much, which is really what I'm the most excited for on this new yeah, edition. That's a really good point is one of the things I hated when teaching new players how to play with matched play rules was the moment where I'd have to tell them to pick three tack ops. And they're looking at this list for the first time. And they're like, I have to pick three of these. Like, Oh my goodness. Now they just pick one. And they can just focus on that one while they're playing the mission. And kill op is just like there in the background happening. So I think it's a lot easier to digest a new player to take in like the the procedure of playing a matched play game, which is really nice. Yeah. And just like the the the, the whole start of the game, I think the whole game is going to be faster because it was just like you choose your team, you start with the faction equipment, um, you it just like it's super duper streamlined where you just like get into the game way faster. Turn one, you don't have to like get all fiddly and weird. You just like can get right into the game, um, and then like start. You don't even like start scoring until like halfway through the game because it's like turn you know <laughs> the end of turn two you're scoring. Yeah. Yeah, because not all the missions score at the same cadence. That's going to be a huge adjustment phase for all the tournaments. Oh, because sure. I am fully excited to roll a ten-sided die and tell everybody we're playing this mission. We'll see how it goes. Yeah, there are some yeah. some really zany ones out there. Um, like one of the ones I I haven't like really deep dived at the missions, but um, one of them is like you, uh, as a strategic gambit, you choose one of the objective markers to be active, and then if you do an action on it, it's worth a point. If you control it at the end of the round, it's worth a point, and then also controlling t more than your opponent is worth a point. So there's, it's like incredibly dynamic, like someone could uh, win the gambit, choose the one on their side of the board, just like dominate it, but then the other player could take um, the other two objectives, and mm -hmm. then like you're only down one point that round. Um, yeah, and like, uh, there's another one, I don't remember what it's called, but I played on it where it's kind of like loot, except it's, you can do the action on, even if your opponent's done it on the objective, and it all scores at the end. And it's whoever has more scores for that point. And if it, like the one on your opponent's territory is worth more than the ones in the midline in your territory. And it's like, it's just different little ways to think about these missions. Like, I think some people saw nine missions and they're like, oh my God, I have to play like recover Archeotech again. But it's not like that. I think they're all actual like competitively designed. Yeah, I played you know, extraction on the play on tabletop episode for anyone who's joining us from there. And I went down all the main mission objectives because I just wasn't on the points and the Vespid was just sitting on them. That was a little spooky. But one of the cool design things of the new ex new missions and actually how the game is designed now is each track is worth exactly the same amount. So even though some of the tracks you could theoretically score more than six over the course of a game. Now you're capped at six like you know that if you're losing a, a lane, you can actually back off that lane, and that can be really nice, like from a tactical decision-making process. Yes. Um, I wanted to change the conversation a little bit and talk a little bit about how you guys think the game plays on turn one with no scoring, because I've seen... I, th I think some people are going to look at this and say, like, oh, so the, the first half of the game is going to be very, very passive. Like, on turn one, you're not incentivized to do anything. And there's going to be some games where both players just be very passive. And then the first half of turn two might be really passive as a result of that. Um, but I think there are some teams that can exploit this a little bit more than others, like Commandos, for instance. Stuff like Shush is way better now because you can set up passively on turn one. And then if you win initiative on turn two, you can have like this asymmetrical threat where you dash forward and then you fight, whereas your opponent might not have that. So I think that's really interesting. I think it'll bring out a lot of tactical richness. Uh, mm -hmm. I 
I'm kind of it's not like the most interesting turn one play for me. Like I do like the pressure of having to go do stuff, but I think ultimately a big part of this edition is trying to smooth out the gameplay experience for new players. And that first turn creep of there's all this stuff that you could do. You got to score. You got to do all the stuff is kind of yeah. eased off. And now you're going to do the same amount of stuff, really. Like those next three turns, two, three and four, there's going to be a lot of gunfighting, a lot of shooting. So I don't really mind it all that much. But it does mean that there's going to be some players, you know, maybe Jason ignoring obscurity with his Phobos and cursors are really yeah. going to try to abuse your opponent on turn one and start the start the chain of violence as early as possible to really make sure that by the time you get to turn four, there's nothing left. Yeah. Um, cause it is a pretty like solved, easy to see, like fundamental thing. Like the maps didn't change enough that this is untrue except for like maybe into the dark, but like in general, you can just like barrel across the whole map and get angles on people. Um, actually, I haven't thought that much about Volkus because that might that might kind of tone that down quite a bit because there's a lot of heavy. There's like those buildings that have four walls and all that craziness. But just like just like barreling down the field and getting angles on people on turn one is like historically a very easy thing to do. Um, like even people that are like concealed in heavy cover, like, I mean, I've had like a bajillion games where people were like, oh, I don't think you're going to shoot me on turn one. And then I deploy on all engage and I get like 10 shots and everyone's like, this doesn't make any sense. Uh, it's very doable. It's, I think it, there is definitely a real potential, especially if you just like start putting people on engage and like giving people targets, it's going to be hard to ignore that. And if you can just like stand out there and tank shots and just like, dial up the violence i think it has real potential to be like a passive like creeping kind of like kg game or just ultra violence immediately yeah the fact that everyone can do the cult ambush stuff where you flip over your your orders on turn one means that you, you don't have to be violent but if your opponent gives you bait and you look at the bait how many players are really going to resist the bait right because now yeah. resisting the bait doesn't necessarily imply any level of safeness, right? You could be obscured, but obscurity doesn't do the thing that it used to do where you just wouldn't get shot, right? So if your opponent gives you a piece of bait, you take the bait in obscurity. If everybody else shoots that one dude, you're like, oh, no, that guy still died because he took four dudes double shooting bolters, <laughs> you know? Like, he could still die. And that still means that your opponent is now forced to react to that. And if you didn't kill that Marine on turn one, and plasmas don't necessarily kill Marines on turn one anymore... There is like a real chance that you could get used to people being very passive, but maybe that's not always the right choice. It just kind of depends on the matchup. And I think that's the thing that I'm the most looking forward to because we are so fuzzy in the fog of war as far as kill team strategy goes. Really, there. this is like the perfect time to jump in. If you've never played kill team, like go find your local shop, get a demo and let's go. <laughs> Yeah, and like there, yeah. there is so much richness, like we've been saying, and I think no internet expert is going to be able to like predict the depth of these missions. And like, if you are innovative, you can definitely come up with things that catch people off guard. And like, you can beat all the odds, you can beat all the internet opinions, and you can be that like hero with a unique strategy that's awesome and actually works really well. And there's just so much content to be able to do that. And just really, really reward that innovation. Yeah, because me and Jason, we've been doing this week to week stat show for our Patreon listeners. And a lot of the times there's a team that won't really do all that well from week to week. And then, you know, like three players in some random regions will take them and do very well with them. And I think this current edition that we're going into is really going to have a lot more of that because the stats on the top level really don't mean all that much for a game at kill team size like sure when you get to commandos we know they're like eh, about a 50 50 team at the moment they're pretty good because they can do everything they've got enough operatives they're pretty tanky but when you get down to you know there's like 10 players playing higher tech circle they've been doing pretty poorly then at nova we had leander g go seven and one you know crushing everybody on a team that everyone kind of put the rest in peace markers next to yeah it's crazy I, i'm yeah. really excited for for just seeing what people come up with and the strategies that kind of get laid out. Cause it's, I don't know, there's going to be a lot of new approaches and I think that's good for the game. And, you know, J Shane, you you guys over on command point, you guys are running digital tournaments. I'm sure there's going to be a digital tournament pretty soon. You guys have anything planned? Uh, yeah. So the command point, um, discord server is going to continue to run, uh, the CPTS, so CPTS season nine will be the next one, and that is obviously going to be 
uh, on the new edition once that's uh, all released. I'm personally taking a little step back from from running it, but I'm more than certain that this is still going to happen and and that there is going to be uh, some some cool people TOing these these events for us and you know ways for people to get games in on the new edition. So if you're if you're interested in TTS, it's very easy. Uh, come check it out and um, come play games on the Discord.